short. Open. Chicago with the lead. The Chicago Bulls have won their sixth NBA championship. By now that pretty much everyone in the country who's listening at all knows that Michael Jordan is retiring again from professional basketball. I am here to, to announce my retirement from the game of basketball. I had my great reign in basketball. No matter what you guys say, if I come and hang around the game, because I still love the game better than being a back. Speculation has ended. Rumors confirmed. The greatest player of all time is back. And he's wearing a Wizards uniform. The story of Michael Jordan needs no introduction. The tales of his journey to becoming one of the greatest athletes the world has ever seen, from being cut by his high school varsity team to the flu game, have been told countless times, some becoming somewhat legends themselves. However, for many, the journey of Jordan as a basketball icon ends the day he hung up his Bulls jersey. The headlines end, the documentary stop filming, and the spotlight fades away. And while that was the last time the world saw Michael at his most memorable, the reality is that's not where the story ends. There's more chapters in his legacy that deserve to be explored. A brief moment in time where we saw one of the game's greats try to defy Father Time. And for a split second, maybe he did. Following Jordan's retirement after winning his sixth championship in Chicago, professional basketball moved on just like it does after all great players retire. MJ had distanced himself from the game as much as possible, occasionally stopping in the facilities to play pickup games, but trying hard to avoid speculation he would ever make a return. There's no chance, ever, right? None at all. I had my great reign in basketball. No matter what you guys say, if I come and hang around the game, because I still love the game, that doesn't mean I'm coming back. In the Bulls' absence, new dynasties rose in the place of old ones, and new stars emerged from the shadows of past icons. The end of the 90s saw the birth of some of what would be basketball's brightest stars for decades to come. Players like Kobe Bryant, Tim Duncan, Vince Carter, and Allen Iverson all grew to become the faces of a new era in the NBA. And for a competitor like Michael Jordan, who was watching from a distance, this presented a new challenge. Only this time, it wasn't on the court. Now, do you have, I mean, do you ever have second thoughts? Do you ever say, you know, like today, I just feel like ah, I should be playing. No, no, I don't really? regret my decision at all. I yeah. think it's the appropriate one. Or else no one else will have an opportunity to win if I keep playing. <laughs> After being away from the game of basketball for almost two years, in January of 2000, Michael Jordan agreed to a five-year deal to become the head of basketball operations for the Washington Wizards. This included a minority stake in the ownership of the team, which was set to raise to 20% if the Wizards exceeded expectations. In his time off the court, Jordan had become increasingly interested in running a franchise, even trying to purchase the then Charlotte Hornets before the deal fell through. You were going to buy a team, what, it was the, the Hornets, right, Charlotte? Yeah. Well, actually, they came to me. I think uh, I didn't search out their opportunity. Right. They came to me and said, well, what do you think about it? And I evaluated it, and you know, it just didn't fit. You know, I wanted to uh, have a lot more control than what they were willing to give. And yeah. you know, respectfully, I mean, he... He made the choice that he wanted to make, and I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I'm happy that he did, but you know, I could not participate if I, if I couldn't make the final decision on my money. Michael's new role allowed him total freedom to build a franchise the way he wanted, something that he wasn't sure of, saying, quote, this is new to me. Being in charge is something that I never had the opportunity to do. Maybe that's not the ingredient to turn this thing around. Then again, it may be. That's the beauty of trying. Jordan had its ups and downs in his first offseason in control, choosing to reach for high school standout Kwame Brown with the number one overall pick in the 2001 NBA Draft. Brown would go on to have a 12-year NBA career, where he put up respectable numbers but never lived up to the expectations of a number one overall pick. In the meantime, Michael was left with the task of rebuilding a team that had finished with the second worst record in the entire NBA. 
how would the greatest competitor the game had ever seen on the court be able to turn around a franchise off of it? However, instead of bringing in a new front office, reevaluating the roster, and bringing in young assets to replace the older players on the roster, Jordan chose to do something different. On April 20, 2001, the Wizards announced the hiring of 49-year-old Doug Collins to become the team's new head coach. Collins had been the coach of a young Michael Jordan during his early years as a Bull, and had been out of the league since 1998. Naturally, this raised some speculation about whether or not Jordan was considering a comeback. Over the course of the offseason, Jordan hadn't made any changes besides adding his own former head coach and drafting a promising big man to the roster, failing to land many younger players or assets to the team. Now, with 2001 quickly approaching, some big questions were being raised in DC. Just as the media had speculated for months prior, on September 25, 2001, a 38-year-old Michael Jordan announced his return to the game of basketball. After almost three years, the greatest player the game had ever seen was making a comeback to the hardwood. The move was met by a mixture of excitement and concern, with many diehard fans believing Jordan could ruin the storybook ending to his career. However, none of this phased Michael. The entire offseason leading up to the 2001 season, Jordan had been quietly training to get back into playing shape, inviting many of the top players from around the NBA to come play organized pickup games. Just as I started to play against some of the other players who played in the league, uh, see if I could get some of my uh, moves off, uh, maintain some type of consistency to stay with them. Although I know this is not, in the summer, it's not the same as the season. Uh, I was looking for any kind of signs that uh, would give me the motivation that, you know, hey, if I get and start working fit, fitness, fitness wise, I get myself in good shape. I can compete. I can, I can make this thing work. On October 30th, 2001, Michael Jordan made his return to the NBA in Madison Square Garden against the Knicks. The build-up to the game made it one of the most anticipated matchups of the year, as the last time the world had seen Jordan on the court was the 98 Finals. Michael would score his first basket less than two minutes into the game, having an up-and-down game on his way to a 19-point outing. With 18 seconds left, the Wizards had the ball with the chance to tie the game. Everyone in the garden that night knew who would take the shot, and it seemed like this was the beginning of a new chapter in Jordan's legacy. By the Wizards, Michael Jordan, with Whitney's have the hot hand. Wizards down by three, Jordan for the tie, rebound by Kirk Thomas, boots it to the floor and a foul. The Wizards would go on to lose by two in their opening game, and leave many people wondering if Jordan had made the right decision in his return. As the early season wore on, Washington got off to a slow start, winning only two of their first 11 games and struggling to find chemistry. Though they were far from competing for championships, Jordan still had championship expectations in practice, pushing some of the young players harder than many of them were ready for. Well, like I tell people, Michael was fun. He had a unique personality. But then there was also another side where it was the talk in trash Michael Jordan. And at times, me and a couple of the young guys would come up to him and say, hey, Mike, why don't you think about putting us in the brand Jordan collection? Right. And he'd look at me and say, hey, Rip, my, sneaker for, my sneakers for all stars. In addition to this, the team was struggling with the newfound national spotlight. Though they had gotten off to a rough start, MJ was still must-see TV. And the Wizards had gone from 28th in the league in attendance to selling out every home game and found themselves on national TV almost every night. An overtime win against the Celtics sparked 16 wins over their next 25 games, putting them on pace to make the playoffs for the first time since being eliminated by none other than Jordan and the Bulls back in 1997. Over this stretch, Michael was averaging over 25 points per game, showcasing a scoring ability that many people didn't think he still had. Specifically after a bad loss against the Pacers, Jordan was out to prove that he could still play. When I was coaching in Washington, we played the Indiana Pacers, and we were down 25 at the end of the third quarter. And I took Michael out of the game, and I said, look, Michael, uh, I know you think we can still win this game, but we got to play, you know, in, in, in two nights. and, and uh, 
if we make a little run, I'll put you back in the game. Well, we didn't. Well, well I found out that uh, after the game was over that uh, he had eight points in the game and he broke a streak of like 860-something games in double figures. Fast forward, we get on the plane, we get back about 3.30 in the morning in Washington. We play the New Jersey Nets the next night. And Michael scores the first three times he has the ball. Byron Scott takes a timeout, and My Michael comes over and he says, I want the ball right there the rest of the game, and don't take me out till I tell you. And so that's, that's fine by me. So <laughs> with two minutes to go in the game, he gives me the sign, like, that's enough. I take him out of the game. He walks over to the bench. I said, like, Michael, like, what happened tonight? He said, well, the guy who was guarding me was telling me, told me his back was hurting. Don't ever tell me you got a problem. He said, I'll, I'll make you pay for that. 51 points later. 51 points at age 41. He came back the next game with 46. And he looked at me and said, I told you I could still play. Jordan's 51-point performance against the Hornets was the record for points in a game by someone over the age of 38 at the time, and was followed up by a 45-point outing the very next game against the Nets, proving that MJ was still capable of being one of the game's best players even past his prime. During these two games, Michael was scoring at will, getting to all his spots with ease and showcasing a veteran skill set that was much different from the Jordan we've seen in the past. Crafty layups around the rim replaced high-flying dunks, and fadeaway elbow jumpers filled the stat sheet instead of acrobatic finishes. Michael Jordan was no longer the player the world fell in love with in Chicago, but one thing remained the same, he could still prove all the critics wrong. Heading into the All-Star break, Michael Jordan was on pace to have one of the best individual seasons of any player that year. In fact, Jordan and Kobe Bryant were the only two players in the entire league, averaging 25 points, 5 assists, and 5 rebounds per game, putting Michael at the heart of the MVP race midseason. He had motivated his Wizards team to a respectful record after being one of the worst teams in the NBA the year before, and Washington saw young players like Rip Hamilton becoming reliable threats every night. Then, and just as it appeared things were headed in the right direction, everything changed the last game before All-Star Weekend. Off the glass, what a shot! And he's down and he's hurt. He hurt his knee. Jordan would collide with teammate Eton Thomas, resulting in a lateral tear in his meniscus. He would try to push through the injury, but after losing 9 out of the next 10 games while trying to fight through the pain, he finally had enough. On February 27th, Jordan elected to have arthroscopic knee surgery to repair the torn cartilage in his knee, and after attempting to make a second return that season, decided to sit out for the rest of the year. Jordan's first season with the Wizards was filled with ups and downs on the scoreboard, but Michael had proven that he could still compete with the NBA's best. He averaged 22 points per game and led the team with 5 assists, helping to lead the Wizards to an 18-win improvement over the previous season. Now there were multiple questions surrounding the future of Jordan and Washington, and the 2002 offseason could determine the future of the franchise. The 2002 offseason marked a crossroads for the Wizards organization. With Jordan announcing he would return for the following season, the team was left with two options. Should they bring in young talent to help build for the future, or should they trade away their young assets to bring in some players that would help the team win now with Michael's playing days inevitably numbered? Not surprising many, the team chose to do the former, signing an established scorer in Larry Hughes and trading away a young Rip Hamilton to the Pistons for Jerry Stackhouse. Hamilton was coming off the best year in his young career and would go on to win two championships with Detroit and make multiple all-star teams. Meanwhile, Stackhouse had established himself as one of the NBA's best players over the years, averaging 29.8 points per game just one year prior. If the direction was uncertain before, these moves confirmed the Wizards' intentions. It was now or never to make a playoff push. Some people would question these moves at the time, wondering why a franchise would throw many of their young assets to the side in hopes of winning with a going on 40-year-old Michael Jordan. That being said, the stage was set for what would become MJ's final NBA season, and the spotlight on Washington was brighter than ever. Michael's second year in Washington took on a much different look from the first. 
With Jordan still nursing his lingering knee injury from the year prior, he elected to come off the bench as the sixth man for the beginning of the season. Injuries would take a toll on the Wizards throughout the first half of the season, causing MJ to eventually take his place back in the starting lineup. Interestingly enough, he would be the only one on the roster to play in all 82 games that season, averaging an insane 37 minutes per game at the age of 40. The team itself was inconsistent throughout the season, never overcoming the 500 mark and just barely being out of playoff contention in a weakened East for the majority of the year. While Stackhouse had become the primary threat offensively, Jordan remained the highlight of the team throughout the season, averaging 20 points per game on the year and scoring over 40 points per game in three games that season, including becoming the only player in NBA history to score more than 40 at the age of 40. The most memorable moment came at 2003's All-Star Weekend, where Jordan would be voted in for his final All-Star appearance. Atlanta was buzzing with nostalgia, as people had begun to realize this was the last time we would see Michael alongside the NBA's best. Though he'd been voted in as a reserve for the game, numerous players offered Jordan their starting spot, which he eventually accepted from Vince Carter. The game itself serves as one of the last iconic moments we have of Jordan on the hardwood. Michael went toe to toe with some of the very players who had grown up idolizing him and finally got to have a face off with a student of his own game, Kobe Bryant. Mike, after you face the ball, where else you, you go? You left your feet. Yeah, but where else you gonna go? In the game, I go for you. I spun all the way around. I go for these ribs right here. At halftime, Jordan was honored with a tribute from Mariah Carey, a performance that served as the perfect send-off from the NBA's biggest stage. However, this tribute wasn't the only glimpse of vintage Jordan that would be seen that night. With the game on the line and the East in possession, everyone in the arena knew who was taking the shot. Michael has the ball, and it got it by Sean Marion. The fadeaway, yes! With four and eight tenths seconds remaining, the West takes a timeout. While the game would end up being won by the West in double overtime, Michael had given the world one last moment to add to his legend, something that many thought they would never see again. Michael Jordan would play his last professional basketball game on April 16, 2003 against the 76ers. The basketball-loving Philly crowd was electric, and everyone wanted to get a glimpse of Michael's last moments on the hardwood. The game itself didn't have much to offer. Jordan struggled from the field and eventually took a seat with the game out of reach. But chants from the crowd for Mike to step back onto the court for one last time at the end of the game were met with Jordan slowly getting out of his seat and making his way to the scorer's table. Michael would be intentionally fouled and hit two shots at the free throw line for the final points of his NBA career. It wasn't the storybook ending that Jordan's last game in Chicago had been. There were no championships on the line, no national spotlight, and no game winner. The greatest player that had ever touched a basketball to that day walked off the court and into the darkness of the tunnel for the final time. Michael Jordan's return to the game of basketball in Washington will always be seen by many as an eyesore to his storybook career. The images of him jogging his way up and down NBA courts in a Wizards uniform against NBA stars who were much younger than him will always pale in comparison to the memories of him flying through the air in Chicago and winning championships. But to ignore the way the story ends means you miss out on the beauty of his final moments on the hardwood. Very few people ever get to be the best at what they do forever. But even fewer get the opportunity to return past their prime and prove that they still have a glimpse of what made them great. Jordan's last years with the Wizards gave Michael the chance to face off against some of what would become the NBA's next wave of star players, meaning he had played against three generations of the best the game had to offer. No, Michael wasn't the same dominant player that the world fell in love with, but at the age of 40, he was still able to compete at the game's highest level even proving at times that he was still one of the best players in the world. Time doesn't slow down for anyone, but to be able to defy time for even a moment, the same way he seemed to once defy gravity, is what made Jordan's time with the Wizards so special.
What's going on y'all? This is Trice. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. Thank you for your constant support. This is one of the most fun projects I've ever been a part of. Um, it was a lot of fun to do a lot of research on Michael Jordan and kind of how his career ended. He's always been one of my favorite players, so diving into the way his career um, came to a close was very interesting to me. Um, huge shout out to the producers of The Last Dance on ESPN and Netflix. They inspired this project made me really want to dive deeper into documentary style videos so hopefully you enjoyed it it took a lot of time like i said um, this is the first video i really promoted a lot on social media myself uh, creating some twitter pages and things like that so if you came from that campaign thank you for taking the time to research this video and find it um, it means a lot to me personally and I'm, I'm hoping that you enjoyed it and you got something out of it if you are interested in all in this type of content please subscribe to my channel i have a lot of different basketball content on my channel that is very um, in-depth like this and enjoyable and i'm always looking for ways to entertain you guys so please check those out subscribe for more content and remember to turn on post notifications so you don't miss any of my new projects that drop as soon as they hit youtube i don't want to take any more time of the day remember to connect with me on social media as always this has been trice god bless